formation, it is still a fairly new state formation. Even if you started with the Republican period, it's 1911, but that was a very short period of uh, new state, and the real state building state uh, formation process will be started with the Communist Party. So uh, then the interesting thing about post-colonial nations uh, um, is, is that the history, because they are post, because they essentially post uh, Second World War, the history is still relatively shallow, and uh, and and the, the, the actual formation process is still very much on government rather than state, which is also why you see that in Asia nationalism continues to be a very important effect in a, a very important sort of uh, sentiment. Uh, both at the level of political leadership and at the level of the people, uh, of citizens themselves, and then this national, this particular nationalism often becomes fairly sort of uh, constraining uh, on the state and also on the people, and often comes out as somewhat xenophobic and somewhat racist, depending on where they're working with that. So I want to actually sort of look at this post-colonial nation, particularly in, in my case, I want, I'm, uh, I want to use the case of Singapore and Malaysia as a kind of illustration of two trajectories of uh, post-colonial development. That is, uh, because of nationalism, actually became much more and much more narrow-minded than, uh, ironically, its colonial days. So that's why the title of sacrificing cosmopolitanism for the post-colonial nation. So interesting. I mean, Southeast Asia. When you read about post-coloniality. It's very ironic that Southeast Asia seldom gets mentioned in the sort of general literature of post-colonialism because post-colonialism seems to be fairly dominated, Asian post-colonialism tends to be fairly dominated by South Asian writings rather than Southeast Asia. And in fact, Southeast Asia, the, you know, the, the irony is that Southeast Asia is one of the most colonized space in the world. I mean, there as of course French Indo China, uh, British, uh, British Malaysia, Singapore, Burma, and for 300 years Indonesia being colonized by the Netherlands. And yet, most of the writings of uh, post colonialism seem to get very little mention of Southeast Asia. In fact, in, uh, in the sort of book called The Short History of Post Colonialism, uh, Vietnam gets maybe two mentioned. Even the long war in Vietnam that went on forever, it hardly ever so come up in the discussion. So I mean, so looking at Southeast Asia is so um, in the post colonial literature is something that still needs to be sort of explored. In the Singapore and Malaysia case, during the colonial period, the colonial administration had like you know, like the case of Sri Lanka, had actually imported a vast number of people from elsewhere into the colonial into the colonized territory. So in general, in the you know even in the case of just like the West Indies, uh, the colonized territories tend to be filled by the different labor needs of the colonies, and so you have actually in a combination of uh, of several categories of migrants slaves, convicts, indentured labor, and voluntary migrants in search of economic opportunities. So the result is that in most colonized, most colonized territories, the result is often a multi-ethnic and multicultural space in which the different migrant groups coexist, and usually policed by a surprisingly small group of uh, administrators from the Metropolitan Center. And often 
this very small group of administrators were supported and assisted by local of migrant civil servants and police and the armed forces. So the social condition, the social economic conditions in this in such colonized territories were supposedly quite rigid and ethnically stratified, uh, with of course the white population at the pinnacle of power, and more often than not the indigenous population at the bottom, <coughs> with the different immigration uh, mig in, uh, migrant groups filling in between mediating the transaction between the colonizers and the indigenous population. And very often, a particular group of migrants uh, will actually be selected and given the privilege to act as the comforter on behalf of the colonizers in the economic exploitation of the indigenous population. There was thus an ethnic an ethnicity based, so within this kind of colonial space is an ethnicity based division of labor and economic activities, including intra ethnic divisions. So, for example, in the case of Singapore, the Chinese military community in colonial Singapore was constituted by uh, trade specializations by different ethnic, different dialect groups within the Chinese community itself. And this kind of this this kind of ethnic and economic stratification, in in the case of South Asia, I mean, most of you, most of uh, you who are familiar with the post-colonial literature of literature of colonization would be familiar with this notion of a poor society, which is actually um, which means that different groups of uh, Different ethnic groups went about their routine businesses of living without concern for each other. So it's a fairly rigid kind of a separation between, supposedly fairly rigid kind of separation between different groups. But in fact, this wasn't quite happening, although this is the term actually promoted by a member of the British, uh, uh, British civil uh, colonial administration the guy called J.S. Furnival, who was a British colonial administrator in Burma. So his idea that is, you know, colonial societies are poor societies in the sense that it's quite different from what we now understand as pluralism. I mean, plural in simply, in a sense of plural in that instance, actually is more numerical than mixing and then uh, keep them, so to speak. So, to a British colonial administrator who actually who, uh, who was who were at the apex of the social structure, so that as members of the colonizing race, they were actually either insulated from the other immigrant groups or are in fact administrators and that, that polices the social and political tensions among the colonized groups. And but among the colonized groups. The tensions, that, that, the, the political and social tensions among them will, will come to occupy center stage after decolonization and after political independence and the subsequent nation building process. Under the colonial regime, the immigrants were simultaneously protected and neglected by the colonial administration at the same time. Protected because they were allowed to remain and free to engage in the economy of the territory. Neglected because no attempt was ever made by the administrative colonial regime to secure for them permanent residential rights in the territory. The colonized territory is, in an interesting sense, a non-place. It is, it is a non-place because it is not a space for emotional investment or identity formation by the immigrants themselves. The immigrants tended to view themselves as short-term visitors, <coughs> uh, temporary residents, and therefore constituting diasporic communities. And this notion of being diasporic continues to uh, be used uh, politically in the, in the independent nations, subsequent independent nations. So 
most of the immigrants then within the colonial space were emotionally and politically oriented to the, to the ongoing activities in their own respective homelands. Nevertheless, their migration and sojourn in the foreign land in this colonized space and mixing with people from elsewhere inevitably imparted to them a certain openness to others, to different cultures. In short, there is a certain vernacular cosmopolitanism that develops by their very existence, by their very presence in the uh, space as such. Now things change fairly radically with the initiation of decolonization struggle for political independence in the local territory. The prospects of being a citizen of an independent nation provides the material and intellectual space for emotional investment of the self, initiating a different subject formation. And this was true not only for the long-term immigrants, but especially for those who were local born. The individuals, therefore, were frequently active participants in the decolonization struggle for independence alongside members of the indigenous population, sacrificing their lives if necessary. Unfortunately, their citizenship aspirations, the citizen aspirations of the migrants, were not always realized, and their sacrifice were often unappreciated, went unappreciated after political independence was achieved. The, indig the indigenous population were long suffered under colonialism Claiming their rightful place as owners of the new nation might not necessarily accept the claims of the migrants and their descendants of full citizenship in the new nation, especially when the migrant groups have been complicit with the colonial regime in the exploitation of the locals. So the rise of indigenous ethno-nationalism marks the beginning of the emergence of politics of race and racism directed not only at the minority races already in the country, <coughs> directed not only at the minority races already in the country to differentiate forms of citizenship, but also towards, of course, new migrants, new immigrants, arrivals to different intensities of xenophobia. So, that, I want to use Singapore and Malaysia as the illustration of the sort of general processes that I've been talking about. So far. Singapore is a interesting uh, post-colonial nation because Singapore <coughs> is a post-colonial settler nation <coughs> which proclaims itself as a constitutional multiracial nation. And I want to use that, use this so-called this really multiracialism in Singapore. Uh, to chart out one of the parts in, uh, in the new nation formation. Singapore is a multi-race nation because there's an evolution of a from a colonial multi-ethnic world society which has engendered a vernacular cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitan culture. There is Singapore actually, Singapore is actually a population that understands and accepts cultural differences as a result of routine social interactions across ethnic and cultural boundaries in everyday life. And to a nation state with a restrictively defined multiracialism, to evolve into this uh, multiracial state constituted by descendants of migrant ancestry and, and now evolving into a kind of new Singapore nationalism that is destructive of our own path, our own sort of cosmopolitan path. <coughs> this year, Singapore is celebrating bicentennial of the establishment of the trading post for the English East India Company on the island in 1890. It's very embarrassing to celebrate colonialism. <laughs> so we don't call, we don't say it's bicentennial uh, of colonization. We simply say it's the bicentennial of arrival of rebels to establish the British uh, And it gets more and more difficult because uh, 
even the 200 years. So now, even that's embarrassing enough. So now we're trying to recover 700 years of history. That's true. Uh, <laughs> stretching as far back as Sri Vijaya and Manjapahi. Um, terms that most Singaporean youth don't even know what they are. So to get the post established, and this is actually quite important to learn, to learn history because um, to get the post uh, established, Raffles, Stanford Raffles, which is for a long time considered founder of Singapore, which is now embarrassingly, now something we try to distance ourselves from. An officer of the East India Company first had to, in order to establish the, 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 the trading post, he had to first install a prince of the Johor uh, Real Empire, a prince by the name of Hussein, who's the son of the Sultan of Johor Real Empire, who had lost the who has lost the contest to inherit the Sultanate because there were two brothers and uh, he lost that. His younger brother became the Sultan. So what Raffles did was to make Hussein the Sultan of Singapore. There was no such sultanate. He made him the sultan of Singapore, of which he has really, this was an act that Raffles had absolutely no local legitimate authority to do, to enact. Right? It, was, it was executed with nothing more than the imperialist hubris of the East India Company. And so after it, so, but the, the, the trading post is a very limited space, but in 1980, about five years after that, in 1824, the third sort of uh, resident of administrator, a man called John Crawford, intentionally made the Sultan a bankrupt by withholding what was the monthly stipend due to the Sultan. And once the Sultan is bankrupt, so this was a nasty ploy to get the Sultan to finally cede the entire island to the control of the East India Company. In the process, reduced the Sultan to a financial dependency on the company and complete political irrelevance. So given this history of how the island was cunningly taken away from its rightful owner of the, uh, the Joe <coughs> Empire, one would have thought that, you know, Presently, just parenthetically, right? This kind of cunning uh, uh, taking away should leave open the question of the legitimacy of occupation of the island by the colonial regime and therefore, by extension, the present day government. I mean, one could sort of question the legitimacy of the government if, if we had a kind of uh, land reclaim movement going on, but we don't. So the establishment of the trading post revived the fortunes of what was once an emporium, where traders from uh, the Middle East, Arabia, South and Southeast Asia, China, and Europe met. So the emporium rose and fell. So, so, so this 700 years of history is very interesting because Singapore actually rose and fell for within from about the 12th century onwards. Uh, Sometimes it was thriving, sometimes it disappeared from uh, notice. But the, last, the very last registration of Singapore uh, as a kind of trading place was somewhere around 17th century. And between 17th century and the arrival of Raffles in the early 19th century, it was actually quite a sleepy place. I mean, it was a place that was largely neglected. Uh, so if you read the official history of Singapore, we moved from a fishing village to a cosmopolitan city of the world. It wasn't quite a fishing village, but pretty well, nothing much was happening by the uh, late 17th century. Um, so, but once the once the once the once the trading post was uh, established. Then actually, the migration, the uh, arrivals, immigrant arrivals from China, South Asia. South Asia was a lot of the South Asians were actually brought by the company itself, uh, convicts, indentured laborers to work on the plantations in Malaya. And, and also, population from 
the entire Southeast Asian archipelago, which are generically called, I mean generically known as Malays, and other Europeans came. But very, but the Chinese immigrant, the Chinese population quickly became the majority population on the island, and has until today been the major population. So the multi-ethnic composition um, of Singapore actually was already in place in the early 19th century. And in 1876, the island's administration was formally transferred from the East India Company to the British colonial office, making Singapore a crown colony. That's, so Singapore actually is, in a sense, in, you know, uh, typical of the colonial rural society that I have been talking about, where different ethnic groups have routinely engaged each other in their transactions across ethnic and cultural boundaries. So such engagements engender a mode of vernacular for cosmopolitans that recognizes and accept and tolerate their differences without much they, they interact regularly, but they really don't have much serious interest in knowing or understanding each other's culture in any kind of depth. I mean, this is what, in a certain sense, what I call vernacular uh, cosmopolitanism. <coughs> This is reflected until today in the cultural borrowings. So this, you can see the material, uh, the, the reality of this sort of uh, cosmopolitan, uh, the cosmopolitanism in our everyday life in Singapore even today. Because there's a lot of borrowings across ethnic groups in language and in food, especially. So Singaporeans often, um, was self-referencing the uh, local culture, local multi-ethnic culture elements as what we call Rojak culture. For those who are Singaporeans would know what that means. Uh, Rojak, Rojak is actually a street food that is a salad of vegetables and fruits, the composition of which is never steady. It <laughs> uh, depends on what is available and who is making it. Uh, so, uh, the composition is varies according to the vendors themselves. So Rojak culture is a practice of what I could call vernacular multicultural. And within a multi-ethnic population that speak mutually incomprehensible language, incomprehensible languages, the question of which language could serve as the shared language of communication in routine transaction is an interesting and intriguing issue. Significantly, the language that was adopted as the medium of inter-ethnic communication in the colonial days was something we call Baza Malay, right? So Malay of the marketplace, or Malay of the street. Malay language is the lingua franca of archipelago Southeast Asia. So the Surah Baza Malay was actually has a very long history uh, um, because this was a legacy of the pre-colonial days stretching all the back, stretching back centuries when various pigeonized versions of Malays were used among the traders that met um, in, in Singapore from you know, the traders that come from, as I say, Middle East, India, China and they communicated and conducted their transactions through a local language, through a pigeonized local language. And we, so you can find dictionaries and grammar books of Mazar Malay that were produced to train colonial administrators in the early days of colonization. So the, the colony actually inherited this uh, practice. So when I was a kid, um, we, have, we have inevitably learned some of this Mazar uh, Malay language. And it can be quite funny. Uh, because, and it is, you know, when the Chinese and the Indian, when the Chinese speaks a dialect and an Indian that's, that speaks Tamil, uh, between them they will have to use, they will have to speak Malay rather than because the two are usually incomprehensible. So, in the, in the local language, I mean, very often, even in the, 
because I know speakers of our language inevitably will, will insert words and phrases from their own languages. So the language becomes quite confusing in the news. I'll give you a very funny example. Uh, police inspectors, for reasons quite unknown, if you are Hokkien speaking, you will call a police inspector Duaka, which in Hokkien means a big dog. Okay. So, uh, and so a Hokkien speaker speaking to a Malay and not knowing the Malay or English word for a police inspector will literally say, translate it as Anjing Basar, which is the Malay word for big dog. So it says, so, so, I mean, it's completely sort of weird because you're talking about a police inspector using two languages that don't have the word police inspector. And then you're using consolidation of that. Uh, that's, you know, it, it's a, uh, so this kind of space have this kind, so this kind of, a, you know, materialization of a kind of vernacular cosmopolitanism can be seen in different daily practices. What is interesting, politically speaking, is that the colonial space is also, the colonized space is also a place that supports regional uh, political development. Because it's a space in which there is no investment in local politics because there is no local politics. Right. So as a question, um, given, precisely given the neglect of the colonial administration on the cultural and political interests of the different ethnic communities, the, the, the colonial space therefore provided much free uh, provided a lot of room for both cultural and political development of the different communities, different ethnic communities that are living together. As they see themselves as sojourners in Singapore, their cultural and political orientations were always towards development in their own homeland. And, the collect and both collectively and individually, financially and in terms of personal sacrificial contribution, of the Chinese in Singapore to the Republican Revolution in China is actually fairly well documented it as an example. And for example, in an attempt to align Singapore with rising China, the house in which the founding father of Kuomintang and the new China has spent no one than two nights in one of its fundraising travel across Southeast Asia. This house in which he has spent no one two nights has now been married monumentalized as the Sun Yat-sen Nanyang Memorial Hall. This is our desperate attempt to be part of the bigger China community for instrumental purposes. But let's know, so the most well-known about Chinese uh, political nationalism uh, is that is a much more common in the But let's know was the presence of Malay intellectuals in Singapore during the decolonization period, both in their contribution to the political development of Indonesia and of Malaya. Singapore was the place in which in Malay intellectuals and political activists of the entire Malay world in the archipelago would gather part and, or passing through or in fact use a place to hide in temporary exile from their respective colonial governments. Singapore was the place where political ideas were exchanged, propagated, and disseminated throughout the region, as Singapore was the center for Malay publication in uh, the publication houses that is housed in them. In, if you have a chance to visit Singapore, if you're a foreigner, in a location called Kampong Glam, which is the Malay Islamic enclave until today. And Singapore was not only a space for intellectual fervor, but also one that provided material support to regional anti-colonial independence movement. Given its geographical contiguity with Indonesia, the Indonesians in Singapore constituted an important mass support page for the Indonesian political independence movement, both in the, from, from the Netherlands in 1945. So locally, Indonesian uh, would organize strikes against Dutch employers, boycotting loading and unloading of Dutch ships that calls into the Singapore Harbor, harass the small Dutch military contingency based in Singapore, and also most importantly, 
the staging point for the smuggling of arms and other material necessities for the Republican Army. So, so as I said, a colonized space as a space without nation was then one of, you know, was one from which multiple externally oriented nationalist movement could be and were accommodated and materially and ideologically supported. This is quite an interesting uh, uh, situation because it is very is in very sharp contrast with, uh, with the, in the you know with the contemporary situation in which you know exemplified particularly in the Middle East in which the national space has become proxy space for other nations to fight their war in. So if you think of a place like Lebanon, it's been basically being torn apart by the neighboring countries fighting their war in Lebanon rather than a space from which national development could move outwards, rather than being uh, imposed. So in the period of decolonization, the very embarrassingly speedy defeat of the, and surrender of Singapore, the most important military outpost of the British Empire in the Far East, the very quick surrender by the colonial military to the Japanese invasion during the Second War has permanently discredited the, until then, seldom questioned the invincibility of the colonial regime. So when the, colonial, when the British colonial regime returned after the war, it was only to be confronted but with rising local nationalist sentiments throughout Asia. Although the, colonial, although the colonized world society was constituted by multi-ethnic population drawn from the outside, nationalism was an emergence that could embrace the entire population and not just the indigenous people. Nationalism provided the ideological and discursive space for the until then homeland-oriented immigrant communities to effectively invest their, in their own residential location particularly for those who are local-born descendants of immigrant ancestry. So the struggle for the new nation potentially embraced the entire multi-ethnic population. And what happened subsequently, Malaysia, in Peninsula, Malaysia, and Singapore, are good illustrative examples of what happened of the sort of post-colonial uh, nation formation. Although the two territories are geographically contiguous, separated by a narrow strait of the Singapore, the British colonial regime had always kept Singapore for its own Far East naval base, so that uh, when Malaysia was granted independence in 1957, Singapore continued to be a crown colony. So this obviously will have serious consequences. So, but let's just focus for now on development within Singapore post-Second World War. Anyone who is familiar with the history of modern Singapore would have read much about the left-leaning political activism of Chinese middle school students in the decolonization struggle. The left-wing activism was arguably the result of their modernist education in the Mandarin school during the colonial period. Due to colonial neglect, the Chinese took care of their own education, took care of the education of their own children. And so, in Mandarin schools, almost every Chinese residential community throughout the island would have, in, including those in what we now call squatted areas beyond the colonial city limits, would have their own primary schools. Secondary school were less ubiquitous and drew from do their residence from a wider catchment area. And very importantly, Mandarin was Mandarin was adopted as a language of instruction practically immediately after the Republican Revolution has destroyed the Qing Dynasty. So the textbooks that we used for all the Chinese schools were imported from either mainland China or Taiwan, and they were all modernist. They were all modernist in language and content. The literature texts were mostly written by, uh, were by writers of the main fourth cultural revolution period. So this text imparted to the Chinese students critical modernist thoughts and progressive political sentiments, making them highly conscious of the discrimination they faced under the British colonial regime. 
So when the colonial government instigated the conscription of the Chinese students into the army to fight in the insurgency war against the Malayan Communist Party, which was mainly an ethnic Chinese party, they revolted. And this was the beginning of the decolonization activism. So together with the emerging radical labor unions, which were fighting against not only poor working conditions, but also generalized social injustice, they constituted the mass political movement against colonization. Then the rest of the history is kind of, you know, how this uh, mass, this, the, the mass movement joined hands with a group of British educated, university educated professionals to constitute the People's Action Party that still governs Singapore today. The party was formed in 1954. It was really a partnership built in part of on shared decolonization sentiments and impact on political experience. The radicals needed the power of the British educated professionals against potentially being proscribed by the colonial regime, while the professionals need the last to deliver the mass electoral support. Obviously, such a partnership was, was very unstable, and the breakup is, it was inevitable. So it's kind of a very long story short. After the split, the radicals formed a new political party, a Barisan Socialist, but they were immediately subjected to severe political repression, including long imprisonment without trial for allegedly communist activities and communist and subversive activities in the hands of their erstwhile PAP political partners under the leadership of the this was a period, this is, the history of this period continues to incite contest, uh, contest among artists, historians, political commentators in Singapore. And it's unlikely to pass into history without some kind, and this is my proposal for my own country, without some kind of truth and reconciliation process in which the present inheritors of the PAP accept and apologize for the liberal and excessive use of the term communists label to harm many of the innocent individuals at the time and causing sufferings for the individuals and their family. Although I'm pretty sure this apology is not forthcoming. <laughs> not for a long time. So apart from the internal ideological and post-war struggle between the two factions within the party, the repression of the radical left leaders was significantly motivated by the desire of the leaders of Singapore PAP to merge with by then independent Malaya. As the Singapore leadership was at the time unable to imagine the viability of Singapore as an independent island city state. So According to a local historian, the, dis the, dis the decimation of the left right, by imposing this company's label, the, dis the, the decimation of the left was actually demanded by the then Prime Minister of Malaya, Dr. Abdurrahman, as a non-negotiable conditions for merger, for the reunification of Singapore, or into Malaya. Once the suppression of the left was accomplished, Singapore, along with the two small British colonial territories in Sarawak and Borneo, which subsequently renamed Sarawak, formed, you know, formed what is now called Malaysia in 1963. Again, the partnership was not to last, and Singapore left Malaysia, Malaysia in 1965 and became the once unimaginable independent island city state which is now not only imaginable, but realized and often cited as model of global capitalist development. The uncomfortable alliance during those three years are actually theoretically instructive of post-colonial politics of new nations, new post-colonial nations. The fundamental difference between the leaders of Peninsular Malaya, which is now called West Malaysia, and Singapore, was how to define the new nation. The Malays, being indigenous, or claimed to be 
with the name of, with the term, the local term of Bumi Putra, meaning sons of the soil. And they claim, be, claiming themselves to be indigenous and therefore rightful owner of the new nation. Hence, they insist on political control of the nation. A Malay political supremacy is non negotiable. So, what happened then to all the rest? To uh, Malaysia, as you know, has a very large Chinese population and also South Asian population. The Malay leadership's vision of the new nation was therefore, and continues today, to be a Malay Malaysia. In Singapore, although the Malays are constitutionally recognized as the indigenous people, it's a kind of symbolic recognition of Malay as uh, of the indigenity of the region, they are nevertheless a, a democratic minority and in no position to realize the political supremacy of Malays. In contrast, so, the, so even that is the situation, the, the, uh, the PAP leaders of Singapore, the Lee Kuan Yew uh, faction, with its overwhelming ethnic Chinese population, could not actually call itself a Chinese nation because they do not actually have proprietorial rights to the land because they were actually an immigrant stock. Right. So given that the Chinese, given that the idea of the Chinese act, uh, nation is out of the question, the Singapore political leadership ambitious, ambitioned uh, Malaysia as a multi-ethnic Malaysian Malaysia. The difference came to a head when the Malay ruling party in, in uh, West Malaysia, the, uh, uh, the Singapore branch of the ruling party, decided to contest the uh, election, general election in Singapore, thinking that it could actually win the Malay votes, but, um, but in fact, in the contest, lost all the seats it contested. However, the racial tension that was raised during the election uh, campaign resulted in a very, in probably the, the last recorded uh, racial violence in Singapore in 1964. So now that there's a split, we now see the two countries moving in different directions and different trajectories. And these two trajectories are actually, in a sense, in my sort of analysis, two different paths that characterizes uh, post-colonial societies for the nations uh, that we currently see in Asia. One of the, so to look at a Malay, first to look at a Malay Malaysia, the trajectory of the new state where the indigenous population immediately usurped the political power by restricting the power grab as merely the rightful uh, reclaiming of ownership of the homeland and the nation that had been subjected to colonial rules. So when this happened, all non-indigenous people would either continue to be treated as immigrants who were allowed to remain in the new nation on the largesse of the new, gov new uh, racialized government, or given a lesser citizenship, which is always precarious. Citizenship, as you know, can be constituted by a bundle of rights which can be different differently assembled and applied selectively group of individuals by the state. Uh, so in this sense, as I will say, citizenship is flexible and gradated. Uh, so in the case of Malaysia, there were more than one indigenous people. So apart from the Malays, in the West and the peninsula of Malaysia, there were other indigenous people in East Asia, East Malaysia, but they were all put together uh, you know, as the uh, sons of the soil. However, the federal government, meaning the Malay, uh, West Malaysian government in, in Kuala Lumpur is the seat of power that has dominated by Malay politicians uh, from, from West Malaysia itself. So although rhetorically they claim to include the indigenous people of East Malaysia, it was the Malays in the West Malaysia who immediately claimed by full ownership of the new nation. But actually, demographically, the Malays had only a very narrow majority above the combined numbers of ethnic Chinese and South Asians in the country. 
But among it was financially behind the Chinese, ethnic Chinese, who dominated the domestic economy during the colonial period, and then and immediately after independence. So the Malay leaders, at the point of independence, claimed political power, had by necessity to accept partnership in government, in governance with the local Chinese population, and a very small representation or presence of President Indians. But as the new Malaysian nation develops, the sharing of the spheres of power between Malays and ethnic Chinese became progressively tenuous. So Malay political supremacy slowly morphed into Malay ethno-nationalism, reinforced by the common religion of Islam, and thus added to, the eth added to ethno-nationalism its religious unity and solidarity. So the Malaysian Chinese and the Malaysian Indian population has become progressively delegated to a different and lesser citizenship status, including occasionally Malay's extremists calling for them to return to where they came from, in spite of the fact that they have been here since, for the Chinese, arguably since the 14th century. Uh, and for the uh, South Asians, at least uh, from the colonial period, to at least uh, by now close to 200 years. So in general then, the taken for granted the vernacular cosmopolitanism of the colonial periods appears to be weakening if not disappearing. And any aspirations of a post-racial Malaysia appears to be increasingly more remote now than in the immediate years of political independence and an ever receding political horizon. I want to conclude that for Malaysia, the vernacular cosmopolitans of the colonial days is being sacrificed for the ethnomentioned state. The other trajectory is the Singapore state, which, as I said earlier, has developed itself as a multiracial uh, nation. But Singapore is an interesting settler nation, unlike Australia, Canada, or the United States. It's is interesting uh, because in Singapore, colonization did not include the destruction of the indigenous people. And those who survived were economically, culturally, so I quite unlike in Australia and uh, in the so-called white settler nation, right, the indigenous people were not placed in reserves or you know, uh, suffered culturally and socially marginalized. Because in, in the Singapore case, uh, the majority ethnic group who are in fact of migrant stock themselves, and given the recognition, uh, given the uh, recognition of Malays as these people uh, symbolically, they were incorporated into the nation building process from the very start. So. The Singapore and the post colonial state was descendants of colonizing, not of the colonizing race, but were themselves immigrants and therefore themselves colonized subjects. So making the continuation of government by the descendants of the colonizing race impossible. And because they have no proprietor claim, as I said earlier, all right, um, they cannot exit the political constitution of Singapore. Uh, actually became quite complicated because unlike the white settler nation, at the point of this, and as, as, as the history that I've given about how the island was actually cunningly taken away from the, from the Malays um, by the British, by the East India Company uh, officers, right? So without the proprietor rights to the land, the Chinese cannot legitimately establish a new ethno-Chinese nation. And also geographically, in terms of geopolitical situation, Singapore is the only Chinese Chinese dominant, uh, demographic dominant space in the Malay world. And given the Cold War period, uh, Cold War context at the time, if we were to be if we were to set up an ethno-Chinese nation, it would probably, there would be a lot of regional trouble 
um, because the real world will no longer, the, the real world so the real world will stand for it. So the malayment of minority was directly incorporated into the nation from the very outset, and in a symbolic political move, the interesting thing is that even with the incorporation of the Malays, we will still potentially be a really difficult situation of a, Malay, of a Chinese dominance uh, majority and a Malay uh, minority, which would then result in this kind of you know, very strong racist, potentially uh, highly racialized politics. So fortunately for us, there, was a, there is a small South Asian population that is generically labeled Indians, and their, their very presence of this very small Malay uh, Indian community makes it possible for Singapore to be multiracial, <laughs> rather than just biracial, right? Uh, so, uh, and being multiracial allows you know, us to avoid this sort of biracial dominance of politics. Now, there's a lot of advantages of this, uh, this uh, uh, multiracial nation. One of the interesting things is it then it insists on the equality of race over equality of individuals, which allows the Singapore politics to develop a certain direction uh, that is against the sort of logic of individual rights, because a lot of policies are built on the equality of racial groups rather than the equality of individual rights. So and one of the one of the most politically most important advantage is that it allows the government, it allows the state to place itself structurally above all the races and therefore act as the sort of arguably the neutral empire that allocates resources according to uh, either equality of different racial groups or proportionally among the racial groups. So, so, this, so we have actually a state which is not captured. We, we have a multicultural nation in which the state is not captured by any particular racial groups, not even by the majority Chinese population. Right, so it has this the state has incredible amount of independence uh, and insulation from the racial, racialized society. So one would have then thought that in this case, uh, to a certain extent, one would then expect the regular cosmopolitanism of the colonial era to be sort of preserved and continued in the new nation. However, the explicit division of the races so now we call ourselves multiracial, so everyone is actually racial. If everyone in Singapore is Chinese, Malay, Indian, or other, uh, other being Eurasians and all the other, that we too small to actually give a proper uh, uh, alphabet to the other <laughs> Consequently, and so, I mean, so, so one would expect the vernacular part of Poland to be uh, continue, but actually, because of the explicit division of race, in fact, amplify the cultural differences between the races and ignore precisely the complexity of the vernacular multiculturalism and its cosmopolitan tendencies. Consequently, the formalization of multiracialism has the effect of raising the awareness of race difference, of racial differences, compounded by religious differences, and created much greater, greater social distances between the three visible uh, race groups. Uh, and furthermore, the vernacular cosmopolitanism has become progressively disrupted by rapid, by rapid economic development under global capitalism. To enable in industrialization and rapid economic growth, the newly elected government adopted English as the language of public administration and commerce. So in support of this decision, is speeded up the establishment of the primary secondary school in England. So what has happened, to cut a very long story short, is that, is that uh, ethnic languages start to disappear and, and English became the dominant language 
and all the ethnic languages have been now mounted, marginalized. So what has, what has emerged is that Singapore has become progressively an English-speaking nation, with the modern and the culture being increasingly determined by modern capitalist consumer consumerism and their invented festivals and celebrations. Uh, in, the, in the sort of increasingly affluent and globally exposed Singaporean population, in which ethnic cultural practices have become more and more alien to themselves. So, effectively, in place of local vernacular cosmopolitanism, a new meaning of cosmopolitans has in fact been invoked. The cosmopolitanism defined by contemporary cultural capital of the globally oriented, uh, globally marketable, liberal cosmopolitanism, leaving the rest of the fellow citizens in the working class in what the Prime Minister called the domestic heartland. And perhaps it's because it is too new and has yet to take deeper roots, this new cosmopolitanism proves to be not too globally minded after all because in recent years, with the increasing expansion of the economy, there's been periods of larger than usual economic migrant arrivals from largely the rest of Asia and the West. And the general attitude of Singaporeans to these new migrants is often one of fairly subtle and sometimes fairly explicit antagonism. So now there's a palpable divide between local Indians and new arrival Indians local Chinese and new arrival Chinese immigrants, right? So generally speaking, there has been an elevation of citizenship in the identity of Singaporeans over ethnic identity. Singaporeans now mostly identify, especially among the young, identify themselves as Singaporean first and whatever race, respectively, second. And Singaporeans have close ranks and show their soft national solidarity when they organize themselves against, in response to new migrants that cast disparaging remarks on their fellow Singaporeans. So for example, even the National Trade Union Congress fired a female executive officer, an ethnic Chinese from Australia, Australian citizen, in response to her, uh, to Singaporean citizens' outcries against her against a woman's disparaging remark against noise from a local Malay wedding uh, in the residential neighborhood. So in the emergence of a Singaporean identity, citizenship now trumps all other identity markers. And in this and other instances, the Singaporean citizens are pitched against non-citizens and the new middle class liberal cosmopolitan Singaporeans may be said to have failed an essential cosmopolitan value, which is hospitality and kindness to strangers. Thank you.